differently each time. And uh, tonight we were focusing on salvation. Instead of uh, healing, but we managed to pray for some of you who have different ailments. But every time as we come to God, remember that even as we sin in God's presence, His miracles continue to take place. And as we hear the word and open our hearts to the word, His miracle continue to take place. Whatever areas of need, whether it be in our spirits, in our souls, or in our bodies, His miracle continue to take, take place in our life. Amen. Because Jesus is here. He is here in our midst. Though we cannot physically touch Him and contact Him, but He is here tonight to confirm His word, His signs following. We are in the book of Jude tonight. Such a joy to reach the ending. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Next week is Revelation, the last book. And uh, then after that, these meetings would be history. We have a last meeting the next week. And incidentally, for those of you who are looking for the family series book, uh, uh, they are already available in the bookstore uh, outside there. And uh, we promise that we we speed it up to release it. And uh, three of them are available in the bookstore outside there in the family series. And uh, one of the reasons we rushed it was because the Lord gave a dream one day. And uh, in that dream, he spoke to me to hurry up on that book. I was working on other books. I wanted to uh, finish the other bigger ones. He says, hurry up on this one. And uh, I don't quite fully understand his instructions. But maybe because he knows uh, a lot of mistakes are being made in the family area. And one of the books is how to find a life partner. So some of you are making a lot of mistakes in that area. And he doesn't want you to make too many mistakes. <coughs> too many broken hearts afterwards. The book of Jude. And, uh, it's a very short chapter tonight. And we have discovered as we teach through the Bible, in uh, the general epistles, that as we come to 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John and Jude, that they were not only just short little epistles that exhort people, they also have an eschatological content that we never saw before. In a similar way, the book of Jude is written with an eschatological perspective. Now historically, the book of Jude was, was among the last few books that were written Apparently, by Jude's time, a lot of the early saints and apostles have gone home to be with the Lord. And Jude is among those uh, second generation type. And Jude is the half-brother of Jesus and the brother of James. The same James who wrote the book of James. And uh, something was happening in the church. A lot of them were not as Diligent in doctrine and in their zeal for God as the first generation. In fact, some of them have gone aside to errors and wrong doctrines. And so Jude historically wrote with a purpose to tell them, to encourage them, to press on, to hold fast and contend for the faith that was passed on down to their generation. Verse 3 of the book of Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So he exhorts them to contend for the faith that has been handed down to their generation. And that was the historical perspective. 
However, there, it was, there is also an eschatological point of view in what Jude is speaking about. Towards the close of the church age, though the light will become brighter, but the darkness will become darker. And the grey line that is in between light and darkness will become smaller and smaller, thinner and thinner until there is a thin line that divides between darkness and light. That, so that you cannot stand in a fence. You are either in darkness or you are in light. There is no time left to stand on the fence. A lot of people are neither here nor there. But in the last days, if you are not with God, you are against God. In the last days, evil abounds. Good also abound. Holiness increase. But the works of the enemy also increase. Why does it happen? For Satan knows that his time is short. Satan knows that his time is short. And hell was created for Satan and his demons and not for human beings. But Satan in his evil, cruel way, knowing that he has to end up there, has to a certain extent succeeded in pulling human souls through his deception with him to bring them into hell with him. In the book of Revelations, we are told that God created hell for the devil and his angels. There is the fallen angels. Hell was never created as the abode of the human day. It was created for the enemy, not for humankind. However, and sadly, human beings have ignored God, ignored God's laws, and uh, Satan has pulled human souls into that area. As we consider the book of Jude, we see that Jude also eschatologically speaks about a time of the last days when Satan will increase just as the Holy Spirit will increase. Every time God moves mightily, Satan seeks to stir up too against the move of God. The Bible is very clear that the end of the ages will be as in the days of Noah, where wickedness abounds. And we see it happening today. In just 50 years, some of the moral standards that were unacceptable long ago are now acceptable. Some of the things that were frowned upon by society as a whole are now socially acceptable. What they call sin, just about 50 years ago or so, they call it an alternative lifestyle. We've seen how uh, society as a whole, without the teachings of God, the teachings from the Word, can go off tangent and uh, produce an immoral society. Therefore, we need teaching from the Bible. We need people to be taught the Bible in order to raise up moral standards and be a light that shines clearly in the darkness of this age. There is no more half-half. It is um, just like a, uh, a comparison between some a revival that takes place in um, a tribal area and in the city area. It's totally different. Uh, there are more temptations in a city than in a tribal area. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> in the uh, seminary days, I was with uh, uh, tribal men from uh, East Malaysia. And he was in a seminary with me and we used to go travel to the north uh, in Perlis to do our field work there and travel back together. And although it was a small little town, it had some cinemas and all those things. And... Um, as far as um, I'm concerned, uh, I don't see cinemas at all, right? And uh, I don't go for cinema shows. Uh, and definitely, there's no, no kung fu show or all that. And uh, 
I was a little bit shocked when this brother who has seen angels, talk to the Lord, uh, came back one night late and I said, Brother, where did you go? He said, Oh, I went to see the film. He said, What film? I mean, he, he's a seminary student. <laughs> and um, I was brought up somehow in my background that uh, we don't do that. And uh, I realized that holiness is not what you do, but what you are. But there were some things that surprised me. Then I realized he doesn't, he doesn't face that choice in his little village. But in the city, we face that choice and we have made that choice. And although they have a powerful revival in the tribal area, you bring a tribal person to live in the city, in three years, they may not be able to live up to their level. Because they face temptations that they never faced before. And although the revival in the city looks different, and we may look more sophisticated, yet, one of the things it produces is that if you're strong, you're really strong. If you're strong, you're really strong. You have been tested. It's just like I used to tell uh, uh, our American friends. They said, over there, immorality is blatantly uh, advertised. And all kinds of sin and pornography and uh, immorality and uh, all kinds of things are available freely out there. And I say that when, when a Christian really choose to live the holy life over there, they really make a quality decision. When I went there, uh, was it last year? I think it was last year. I stayed with an American family. And um, so, I, I noticed that uh, he has made a choice in his life. And he, he does not, he, he's not the average American family. No, he only watches Christian, Christian programs and, and does away with a lot of things that the average American family that doesn't know God uh, would put up with. But yet, uh, when he's faced with all these choices, to be evil, when he choose to be good, he really is good. And there's a stronger goodness about it. And let's put Christians who are in uh, countries like ours, where uh, society is, con- is, is much morally uh, better, better off in that sense, in that we have higher moral standards in our society, uh, in our culture. And uh, we could be a goody-goody Christian. And suddenly, you have an opportunity to go to the United States. You're a good Christian here. And then suddenly, for the first time, you're exposed to all kinds of sin. Your eyes go blurry. (laughs) What do we say? Did you have a stronger Christianity? No. It showed that you did not really. You were shielded from those things. You were untested. In the same way, we realize that when evil abounds and we choose to be righteous, the righteousness is of a quality type. But where evil does not abound and you choose to be righteous, it could be culturally righteous. It is not only your choice, but it's the choice of those around you. And I was counselling uh, this uh, person one day who finds it so difficult to live a righteous life, always falling into sin. And I said, it is so much better to do right because we want to do right. You don't choose to do right because your sin has been found out. You don't choose to do right because People are, are around you, therefore you cannot do wrong, so you do right. That kind of righteousness does not live up to the standard that God wants us to have. So for that reason, in the last days, even though evil abounds when we choose to be good, the quality of goodness and righteousness is of a strong type. You have made a choice. A quality decision in God. And let's look at God's Word 
at some of the prophecies that will take place in the last days that Jude is eschatologically warning us about. And they are taken from the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 onwards. And Paul is talking about the last days. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. In verse 1 it says, there are perilous times. Perilous times will come in the last days. Now Jude is eschatologically writing forward towards those times. How to face those times. And they will come. For it will be as in the days of Noah and as Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Oh, I just read 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. No wonder. Okay. That was 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. But notice that in the last days, perilous times will come. The other one is from 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now we have it. Chapter 4 verse 1. That was from 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. Again it talks about the last times. We know that the church will become more and more glorious. But we also need to be balanced and know what is going on outside. What will happen? Because Christians, we got to make a choice. I have made a choice. In our house, we don't have a TV. We only have a monitor. So for my church, the programs that they see are only video programs that we purchase from the Christian bookstore. And of course, we do have also some uh, uh, some cartoons that are okay for them. But one of our restrictions is every time they see uh, an hour or cut an hour or anything that is not really fully Christian, they must see an hour or something Christian. <laughs> so my son will say, uh, "Pa, I've seen my one hour of uh, Gospel V. Can I now watch uh, Hannah Barbara?" <laughs> Flintstone or something. And, uh, so that is their TV to them. And if you think very carefully, parents, it would be good because I have noticed it. Because sometimes when we travel and, uh, to a place or in a hotel room where there's a TV there and there, there's a program time of, of cartoon, I notice one thing about them. They know exactly what time the cartoon starts. And by the time 5.30 comes, everything stops. So I don't want to be trained to follow the TV program. I want the TV programs to follow them. They lord it over so that they know what time they want to do things and they've done all their things and say, okay, now is the time we can do it. In other words, they are in control of the time, rather the time controls them. And they schedule their time just to hit that time of the cartoon. Everything finishes at 530 Right. So, uh, it, it would, I consider it not the kind of training that I would have for my children. And uh, I would rather bring out my, uh, my children in a, uh, to be able to control uh, and manage their time rather than let something else, a program, manage their time. Um, it's getting very quiet here, but um, <laughs> some of you may be all waiting. I don't know what day, I don't even know what day it is, but... Uh, Maybe you have one of your favorite programs on uh, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. or 8.30. And so your whole life is scheduled around that. And uh, when it comes time for that, you go, oh, whatever it is, the nasty Dallas or whatever. The only thing we tell people, if you see too much of all these things, and uh, when you need faith, 
you can't find it anywhere. See too much gun smoke? When you need faith and you exercise faith, gun smoke comes out. Doesn't help. It's still not too bad in our times today. But let me tell you, it's going to get worse. Outside. Outside. And we may have to make decisions that make us look like fanatics. But I'd rather be a fanatic for Jesus and love the Word and live pure and my life pleasing Him than to be glued and be a TV addict and uh, even if it's a, it's, a, it's a news program or anything, or newspaper addict or whatever addict, I, I would rather that my life please Jesus because one day we're going to meet Him in eternity. And then when He checks a logbook of your life, 2,000 hours of TV. <laughs> then he checks a section on Bible. B. Bible. 10 hours. <laughs> Video. Kung Fu. 10,000 hours. <laughs> right. So, I, I don't want my life to be like that. Time is so precious. And we have to be in control of those things in our life. And if we don't start doing it now, one day, when these things that Paul is speaking about takes place, because Satan and demons know no boundaries. He is called the prince of the power of the air. And his job is to spread evil, sin, immorality. And he spreads it as much as he can. Even some of the good, so-called, quote-unquote, good programs, we've got to watch very carefully whether there's an infiltration coming in. And we have to make choices like that, that we never used to have to make choices. But it's just the beginning. And uh, whatever your neighbors call you, queer, strange, or all that, you know, they pass by, every house has a TV area. Looks by, how come your house no TV area? <laughs> Do you borrow your neighbor's TV area? No, we don't have it. We, we don't need that. We just have the video. Christian videos will do. Praise the Lord. So we have to make choices like that. And if we think that, that we have to do it here, in America, I've come across many strong Christians who threw their TV out. Now, I'm not saying that, that all of us do it, right? Because then some of you are going to persecute me and say, that, that, that preacher, I mean, and some of you may, may sell and own an electronic shop. <laughs> we are not saying that it is sin. The TV is not sin. Long ago when they invented the TV, one old preacher say, watch out, that's the devil there. You can even see the horns coming out. <laughs> doesn't know that's the area. So, that would be wrong. That would be wrong. And I understand that some of you are in business and different line and you need those communications. Now, I don't need it as much as some of you, right? And uh, I, I don't read the papers every day. Once in a while, you know, then we go and get, look, uh, get, get the papers when there's a significant news that we heard that we want some information on or, uh, or something else. But we don't have newspapers coming to our door every day. Why? Because it's a distraction to me. If it's there, you read it. If it's, not there, if it's not there, you don't read it. But if it's delivered to the door, there is always an automatic subconscious effort. Say, <laughs> so why do you read it? Because it's there. So don't put it there. So we never order the newspapers. And uh, uh, so in the morning, I read my Bible first. I read the good news. Praise the Lord. <laughs> good news first. Keep the bad news later, right? <laughs> and, uh, and look at it. Some of these are very simple choices. By emphasizing a fact here, that some of us may have to be prepared that to look very peculiar as society progresses. And you make a choice. Let, just like some of you who, who are rich in God, and God has blessed you, you may be multi-millionaires, and you choose not to drive a Mercedes, you choose 
not to drive a BMW, you chose not to drive a Rolls Royce, even though you're rich. All your other rich friends, you know rich people have rich friends. And all your rich friends will go, Ooh. right? And, and while they come in all, all their huge big cars to a rich man's party, you come in your little Toyota or Honda, and everyone look huh, at you. Why try to be like them? A car is a car. And so we realize that there may be some, some Christians that are starting to come out and dare to be different. We dare to be different. We, we don't have to conform to what is standard. We set the standard and, uh, and not just flow along. Remember the Bible says it's the fashions of the world. They are always there. And uh, we don't have to keep flowing with them and, and, and end up like the world. We are so like the world that we are not like God. God doesn't want one at all. And uh, looking out for the latest fashion. And uh, when the trousers grow big, yours grow big. When trousers grow thin, yours grow thin, right? Why don't you keep your thin trousers and when it grow big, yours is thin, no problem. Later, it comes thin, you're back in fashion, right? No problem. So, we, we just decide our level that we're going to live and stick with it and uh, make a choice. But the day is coming in chapter 4 verse 1 of First Timothy. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The main fact there is people no longer listen to their conscience. They don't listen to their conscience anymore. They do what everybody does. But as Christians, we have a sensitive conscience to God, to what is right and to what is wrong, and we have to daily follow it. Paul is talking about the last days. Think about the people who came to Lot when the angels were trying to bring him out. And Lord himself was becoming like them. He became hardened to, to a lot of things. And I'm surprised at Lord in the Bible. When uh, the people came for the two angels, those must be homosexuals, coming after the two angels, that they may know them. And Lord, Lord wanted to give them his daughters. I don't understand this man. He said that in the word. He wanted to give his daughters to them. That was not the way. It's because he had lived so much in the world that his decision is all based on that area. We need to keep ourselves pure in God. Praise God. Meditate on God's word. Uh, for normal Christians, at least half an hour to one hour. Prayer, one hour. Pray in tongues, one hour a day. Praise God. Minimum. That's minimum. Every day, pray in tongues. Minimum one hour. That's your oxygen tank for this earth. Right? To be in the perfect will of God. Let's read the book of Jude and consider the eschatological perspective as we realize that there are truths here that, that tell us and warn us how to preserve ourselves when, when evil is present in the world. What are the things to watch for? So that we will be among the righteous. We will be among those who, are, who stay true to God. In the book of Jude, it says here, in verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed so long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, there's infiltration into the church and ungodly men have come in and apostate in verse 5. But I want to remind you 
Though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own habitation, He has reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So he talks about, uh, in verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, there's infiltration into the church and ungodly men have come in and apostates in verse 5. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation He has reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So he talks about uh, the angels that we saw in in, uh, 1st and 2nd Peter, how they are locked in chains of darkness, those that have left their first estate and uh, gone away from God. He talks about things that they are terrible in the last days. And uh, basically, some of us think that it's an easy choice. It's not. You don't have to wait until the world becomes very evil to strengthen the quality of your choice. For many people, it's very hard not to read the papers. Try. They find it hard. For some, it's so hard. For some men, telling them to cut off their TV time just to see whether they got control. Just to test out they got control. Okay, for one week, you don't touch it they go into withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> Simple decisions. They, they find they, they have lost control. And remember this, it, it starts right there. On the simplest of choices. It starts there. And it's not as easy as we think. Especially when you know it's available. And... Uh, the TV is there, there is the choice not to see you find is not as easy to make. But that's where your spiritual strength starts coming. You say, no, I won't. And you choose, no, I will not. I'll rather do something else constructive. That's where the strength comes. And I used to hear people crying. And I have cried that cry before. God, I really want to be more holy. God, I I want more of you. Now, God is not asking you to uh, go out and uh, raise ten people from the dead. Yet. He just said, well, if you want to, can you stop seeing seven o'clock news? Oh no, we can't, Lord. I mean, he's not asking you to go and raise ten people from the dead. All he asks is, Son, every morning you must read the paper before you talk to me. Can you stop that and talk to me first? Oh no, I can't, Lord. The battle is over the smallest thing. Not over raising the dead yet. And if we cannot fight the newspaper and win, (laughs) how can we fight the spirit of death? But 
Praise God, there are more and more Christians that are different. Dare to be different. Morning, get up. And uh, that's, that's what they do. They're just praying in tongues. And, and they're different. And they dare to, de- dare to be different. And I realize that when you succeed in a small, small little area, God begins to come into your life in a deep way. It's not the really big, huge things that make Him come. It's the small little things that He asks of you. And very, the strange thing is, is the small things that are difficult to give up. It's the small things. Small, it's too small for us, we think. But to God, this is where the difference between quality and normal is. If we want a quality Christian life, do away with those things. Do away with those things. It's not easy. I remember when uh, I was meditating on the Word for 8 to 10 hours every day in the early ministry life. For one year, I didn't read anything but the Word of God. It was not easy. It was not easy. It is just like fasting. Looks easy. I wait till you walk by the food store. It's not easy. And every time you fast, people invite you for a feast. That's when all the birthdays and all those uh, things take place. And then you have to make your choice. Try going on a vegetable fast. Three days, I tell you, you will long for chicken rice. <laughs> it looks easy. But it's not as easy. As we think. And you realize, hey, my bo- your body is not tame yet. No wonder God cannot work. Start there in the small, small areas. Don't try to be a big hero, you know, raise 20 people from the dead. Right? Just conquer those areas in your life. And that's where the difference is. Now let's talk on some interesting occurrences here so that we could explain there is an area here in verse 9 that we need to explain. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Jesus, dare not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. That is the, the Satan. Understand what happens in the overall panorama of, uh, of the gospel. Ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin, every man who died goes into a place called Hades. And he waits until Jesus Christ comes to this earth. So everyone who dies, both good and bad, goes into a place called Hades. That is before Jesus Christ died on the cross. And Luke chapter 16 describes Hades is divided into two sections. In Luke chapter 16. You have to see the overall picture before we see the specific picture. Luke chapter 16. In verse 23. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and said, and, and sent Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive the good things and likewise your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to there cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. So there they are in uh, Hades, and this is before Jesus died on the cross. And the description is regarding all those people from the time of Adam and Eve right up to Jesus Christ coming. All of them went to Hades. Both Abraham and the saints 
and the evil. And Hades was divided into two sections. Hades is not hell yet. Hades is a waiting point. Now, it, it has similarities to hell, but it's not the lake of fire yet. It's different. The lake of fire only comes in the book of Revelation after judgment. This is before judgment. Hades is more like an imprisonment point or place for spirits of the dead. And it's a prison. But inside, it's divided into two sections. One section called Abraham's bosom. The other section where it's all those uh, who did not follow God. And between them is a chasm that cannot be crossed. And that was a condition that it existed in during the time uh, of the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament. You read about Samuel, uh, how Saul, uh, through that woman, tried to call Samuel up. And... Uh, Somehow, Samuel manifested and it says he came out from beneath the earth. So Hades is located right in the center of the earth. You also find references to it when Jesus said, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Implication in the center of the earth. And look at the cross reference of First Samuel. In First Samuel, in the incident, when Saul sought for Samuel in uh, chapter twenty-eight. Verse uh, 13 and 14. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And he said to her, What is his form? And he said, An old man is coming up and is covered with a mantle. And, Sa and Saul perceived that it was Samuel. So Samuel and uh, all the others were waiting inside the good part of Hades called Abraham's bosom, and then he was there, waiting, waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. There were two parts of Hades, good part and the bad part. And it is found, and physically, if you want to locate it, it's located in the center of the earth. It may be uh, strange to us, but that is the most logical place. Because the earth is round and if it's inside the earth, it's the only place possible. Unless the earth is flat, then it's somewhere else. <laughs> but we all know the earth is round. And in, in case you did not know uh, that the Bible said the earth is round, it's found in Isaiah chapter 40, He who sits on the circle of the earth. And I don't know why, about a thousand odd years ago, Christi Christianity... Uh, itself thought that the earth also was flat. Somebody just didn't read their Bible. But if the earth is round and it's in the center of the earth, it's the most logical mathematical position to place it. And um, everybody was waiting for the coming of the Messiah. The Old Testament folks were saved based on their faith in looking forward to Jesus. In the sacrificial lamb that they looked for, and all the ordinances of Old Testament, the lamb that they put their faith in represent the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ who is coming. So they were saved by looking forward. We are saved by looking back at what Jesus has done. The focal point in history is Jesus Christ on the cross. Something happened when Jesus died. Now, Hades was there, all steady. One good side, one bad side. When Jesus died on the cross, He descended into the lower parts of the earth. His spirit and soul, that is. His body was left up here. He descended into the lower parts of the earth. 
and then he ascended again. But let's look at his descent. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'll give you scriptures for all these things. That we, put it, we put the whole panorama together. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first, first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. And when Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth, we know that down there, He conquered death. Something took place. He conquered death. When He died and descended, there was a physical side effect. In the book of Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 that is when Jesus descended. In verse 51, 52, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after His resurrection. So, before His resurrection, what took place was a mighty earthquake when Jesus descended into the earth. Shoom! And all the the graves were open. And it was like that for three days and three nights. When Jesus rose from the dead, He released all the captives because they were kept by death. Hades, who has... He took the keys of hell and death. The word hell is the word Hades in... Hades. And uh, he took all those keys and then he released all those captives. By captives, he's talking about all those saints of God who were kept in, in a place because there was no Savior yet who has come. And so having come, he took all of them and they are known as the kept, captive. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, we continue the story. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So when Jesus Christ arose, he resurrected all those people who died right up to the time of the cross. So all those people in the Old Testament who looked forward to him, right up to everyone who, who were in his time, like Simeon and all those who were in the New Testament also, but right up to the time of the cross, everyone who had died and were in, waiting in Hades, he raised them up and he gave them a new physical body. They were all physically resurrected, spirit, soul and body. Matthew chapter 27 the next verse, after verse uh, 52, is verse 53. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now we realize in verse 52, And many bodies of the saints that have fallen asleep were raised up. And that's called the first resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So there is a first resurrection that came forth with Him. All those people who died right up to the time of Christ when they were raised up, they were raised up bodily. They received a new spiritual body like Jesus. And they all went on. And some of them popped by in the earth for a moment, but they went on into glory and they are right now in heaven. So, suddenly, Hades, half of Hades, or part of Hades, 
uh, was finished off. And all that remained in the place called Hades is only the abode of the dead waiting for the judgment. There is no more Abraham's bosom down there after Jesus Christ rose from the dead. When he ascended on high, he took them all back to heaven. And it's in heaven where he has mansions and paradise and all those things that God has created for us up there. Anyone who dies today physically in the Lord who believes in Jesus, their bodies die down here. But their spirits and soul go up to be with the Lord. We no longer go down. In the Old Testament period, it's divided before Christ's resurrection and after Christ's resurrection. Before Christ's resurrection, you go down. After Christ's resurrection, because Hades has changed, now all the saints are up there, you go up to be with Him in heaven. The only difference is that all those who died after Christ's first resurrection, after Christ's resurrection, they do not have their physical bodies yet. We wait until the second coming of Jesus. When Jesus Christ comes, then we will have our new physical bodies. But we still go up with our spirits and with our souls to heaven. And there the saints are there. The first batch of resurrected saints are also there. And uh, in the book of Philippians, Let's look at the book of Philippians. And we will give scriptures for all these things. Paul said in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, For I am hard pressed between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul talks about whether he wants to choose to live or to die. And Paul says that to, to, to die and to go home to be with Jesus is better, but yet to remain is needed, needful. And uh, so he, he gives us a clue here. He says that when he dies, he will automatically go to be with Jesus. And where is Jesus today? At the right hand of God. And we know that in the book of Acts, that when Stephen was about to die, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, all ready to receive him. So these are proofs that in the New Testament, after Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, anyone who dies goes home to be with Jesus. That is the panoramic order. So in heaven you could tell the New Testament saints are in a sense uh, incomplete yet waiting for the second coming of Jesus for their bodies. Whereas the Old Testament they have completed their dispensation. That's the full story that we have. Now, this is what we call the normal order. And that is what God ordained. You see, no one could be released from the dead until Jesus Christ came. In the Old Testament, there are three people who were different. One was Enoch, he never died. Death could not touch him. He walked so close with God, that his just body was just transformed and he went up. He never saw Hades. The other person who did not die is Elijah. He never saw death. God sent a fiery chariot. He got into the chariot and he went up. Death never touched him. Third person that we see in Jude. Jude gives us a little bit more story. Was Moses. However, the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus, the last chapter 34, uh, Deuter- Deuteronomy chapter 34 in verse 7 that Moses died. Moses was 120 years old when he died. And when he died the note here mentions his eyes were perfect. 
they were not deemed, nor was his natural vigor abated. That is a good example for us. That is a testimony of Deuteronomy 28. The full promise fulfilled in Moses. So Moses died. God buried him. When he dies, see when a person dies, when we see a person physically die, it is more than natural body uh, uh, discontinued in its function. But their spirit and soul go on. The spirit and soul never dies. It is in a different state of existence. So the spirit and soul of Moses goes into Hades because this is Old Testament time. Jesus didn't come yet. So Moses joined all the saints. All the saints were there. Noah was there. And all the rest of them were there. Abraham was there. And then God did a strange thing. God said, we're giving you the whole picture of the story of Jude. God said to Michael, Michael, I want you to bring Moses up here. For some reason, Moses had been close enough to God to warrant his entrance into God. So Michael, the angel, goes down from God's throne. Shoom. And guess where he has to collect Moses? From Hades. He goes down while everyone is waiting for their flight. 888. The jack plane is Jesus Christ. Everyone is waiting for Jesus Christ. Michael comes out and says, Moses, there is a special flight for you. God sent his personal flight for you. And takes Moses' spirit and soul out of Hades. And came by to collect Moses' body. He's going to physically raise Moses. Which is what Jude says. Jude is not talking about his spirit and soul alone. He's talking about his body. He comes to collect the body of Moses. And as he came to resurrect the body of Jesus, Satan came and made a fast. Satan will be screaming there, not fair, not fair, not fair. And he'll be on strike, you know, with all his play cards. Not fair, this is not fair. God didn't play fair, etc., etc. So he protests. Satan could understand that Enoch, Eli- Enoch was there. Elijah didn't exist yet, but he could understand Enoch was there because he didn't get to touch Enoch at all. The spirit of death didn't get to Get the contact, you know, you not just went up. But death has contacted Moses. And Satan is saying it's not fair. Why did he say it was not fair? Because this is not the normal way. Now we understand why Satan was creating a fuss. And Michael just said, Oh, shut up. And or rather, the Bible says in the book of Jude. Now, this is where the story is in Jude. See, we give you the whole background of the story. So you understand what they were doing there. In Jude, verse 9, Michael says, The Lord rebuke you. What Satan didn't realize was Moses tapped on some laws that could justify we know how God is just that justify his early exit out of Hades and early resurrection what were some of those laws he had seen the back parts of God's glory Do you remember his face shining, coming down? No one sees the glory of God without being changed. 
And I want to challenge you to get closer to God. Sadly, we don't have enough saints seeking the depth of God. But there is a tremendous law that we can tap on. Wasn't Moses on the mount twice? For 40 days and 40 nights, he did not eat or drink, which was physically impossible. The other one who did it was Elijah because he ate special food. We realize, now listen very carefully, here is a key to a blessing. Behind these are certain blessings. If we could right now on this earth begin to tap into the laws of the Spirit so deeply, by the will of God, not just by our zeal, but in our normal walk with God and growth in God, and overcome some of the quote-unquote there is a tremendous law that we can tap on. Wasn't Moses on the mount twice? For 40 days and 40 nights, he did not eat or drink, which was physically impossible. The other one who did it was Elijah because he ate special food. We realize, now listen very carefully, here is a key to a blessing. Behind these are certain blessings. If we could right now on this earth begin to tap into the laws of the Spirit so deeply, by the will of God, not just by our zeal, but in our normal walk with God and growth in God, and overcome some of the quote-unquote human frailties and weaknesses that are common to everyone, we will be able to touch and contact that realm that God allows special grace and favor where you don't see there. We know Enoch is mentioned here too. And there are people like that. That it's a possibility that in our generation we may be able to raise up a generation that will spend so much time with God that by virtue of the laws of the Spirit they contact a realm of God so deep that natural laws are temporarily suspended. That they could enter into a certain depth of God. Now here we are talking about the, the last days. All right? You remember we were talking about how in the last days the wicked will become more wicked and the righteous will become more righteous and holy. Now what are some of those things? We see here that behind the story of Moses here, in verse 9, is not only a story about Michael rebuking Satan, but behind that story is the story of the man Moses, whom God raised up physically before his time. God could have used Elijah or Enoch. But he knows that many of us cannot reach the closeness like Enoch, Elijah. They take real special grace to reach that point. But Moses is a greater possibility for many people. Because Moses was subject to a lot of the laws and a lot of the weaknesses that we are, although Elijah too, in a certain sense, he, the Bible says in James 5 that he was a man of like passion to us. And hidden in the first section of Jude are some of the things that the church will begin to tap upon. You see, what I believe is 
The rapture is an instantaneous transformation that takes place in the church. Shoom! But one thing I also know, it takes faith and the presence of God. When Jesus Christ ascended into glory on high, it is said that the, the clouds surrounded Him. The clouds that surrounded Him is not H2O. Water vapor. You can just go to Gending Highlands and you see the water vapor around you, but you're not floating it. It's not the mist around you. It's the glory of God around you. And it was the glory of God that carried Him up. And the church... I could imagine it. You see, usually there is always an extreme uh, 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 middle balance uh, and then the other slow one. There is always a, a fast and a medium and a slow. When the whole body of Christ is moving to perfection, you always have to have some leaders right at the front who have to spend perhaps ten times as much time with God as the average Christian. I mean, it takes that. The average, uh, the average Christian spends 15 minutes. We've got a little bit of no? devotion time. Or take up the devotional book. In our church, we don't recommend devotional books because it's a lazy man's method. You do that only for lunch tidbits. That's only lunch tidbits. No? That is just potato chips. That's not real lunch. It's all right, right. I'm not against those things. It's nice reading, nice reading, but it takes too fast to read, especially when people like me who read fast. Oh, finish the reading. My devotion for the day. Now, what's on for July sixth? Okay, that's for baby Christians. We recommend for church people go straight to God's word and read. So we never recommend any devotional reading. We, we, we get them straight to read the word. And the average Christian is here, right? Let's say they spend 15 minutes a little bit. Then the stronger Christians, stronger Christians, which are looked upon by the average Christians as fanatics. <laughs> they spend one hour a day and they take one hour to be minimum. So one hour praying in tongues. And... Uh, I don't embarrass anybody, but I, I would dare say that if I say how many here really pray one hour in tongues a day, right, we may not find a whole group here. Now, if that's the way the church is going, how can we be perfected? And what about others who, don't in, don't, who are not hungry for the word as you folks here? <laughs> who wants to come on a Monday night <laughs> just to study the Bible? What about the rest of Christianity? So we realize that there will be a whole group that has to be dragged along by the flow. I mean, everybody is reading the Bible. Yeah, everybody is reading. I better get a Bible too. <laughs> right. And everybody is praying in tongues. Hey, I better pray too. <laughs> right. we, we drag them along. So there's a, there's a, there's, there's a, a, a strong group. There is a nominal group. And to drag the whole group along, you got to have a few strong horses. Just like the geese when they fly. You know, they always fly in a V shape. Because the first uh, goose that flies, duck or goose, that flies, the first one that is right in the center of the V takes the greatest uh, air pressure. And uh, once it breaks the air current, those, the air current is broken in this V form. The other ducks go to the easy path and they find it easier to fly. So he has to fly many times faster. <laughs> and the other ducks on the other V go. <laughs> easier. And the ducks behind them even easier. Right. But a poor chap in front. <laughs> it's not, not as easy. And uh, the ducks or the geese change place once in a while. Because it's a lot of energy. So, so the main ones would change place with him. He goes back to rest. 
But that's something of what we realize that it takes a lot of faith, it takes a lot of word, it takes a lot of prayer to perfect the church. We all should be praying for the perfection of the entire church in the body of Christ. We need the ducks right in the front. Because there are too many of them who are just... (laughs) Some of us are... Oh, we are starting already. We are starting to fly. But at first, all you have is that fellow. And while he's trying to create an air current, all the ducks will say, that crazy duck. <laughs> well, the rest of the ducks don't know that winter is coming. It's time to fly on. And the ducks creating the air current, all of us, that crazy duck. But after a while, a few ducks join him and say, and then you're the one who's crazy to lie behind. Winter is coming. Darkness is coming. And so we got to join the dark there. And as the church goes to perfection, there are some ducks that are right in the front line to get the others in. Now what happens before the church comes? This is what I believe. Those in the front line will walk so close with God that they may suddenly disappear first. <laughs> because they walk so close. <laughs> Remember, it takes faith to be raptured up in a sense. Now, please don't get worried. Some say, hey, I'm not sure I've got enough faith to rapture. <laughs> so tomorrow, some of you are going to join a weight-losing class. You're wondering whether your extra 40 pounds is going to pull you down to hell or what. No. Thank God the rapture is not based on weight. <laughs> We better thank God. Right? Otherwise, the teen people has an advantage. <laughs> the rapture needs faith. Everything God does needs faith. How do you think Enoch got translated? In the book of Hebrews 11, it is by faith. The faith of the entire church will carry the weakest. So there's no worry. It is what I call a cosmic event. And when it's a cosmic event, everyone who is born again will be taken. None will be left behind. Everyone who is even the youngest and the weakest. But it's based on a corporate faith that is there. And we will see those in the front line beginning to go off into God. I know. In, in the research book on the Smith Wiggers word uh, that we had from the town library in, the, in New Zealand, the one of the, uh, it's out of print today, but I had a photocopy, and uh, it speaks about Smith Wiggers word while he was in New Zealand and when he was praying for, for souls. And he walked so close to God, and... Uh, When he begins praying for souls, he enters into a presence that that nobody can stand. And this is the record in that book. He said that he, this author, the one who wrote that about the revival in uh, Wellington, when when Wigglesworth was there, said that he had heard that Wigglesworth prayed, especially in the area of souls. Nobody could be in the same room with him. So when he heard that there was going to be another such prayer meeting, he purposely wanted to join. And he joined that prayer meeting. And so he said, everyone pray. And then when Wigglesworth started praying for souls, when he get into the heart of God, and this is the exact description. Maybe I can bring it down next time and read that portion to you. But it says, that when he began to pray and cry and weep his heart out, suddenly the room was filled with the presence of God. And the more he cried, he says, and this is the record of the book, people started leaving the room according to their, to their spiritual level. <laughs> Those who are lowest, who cannot stand the presence of God, started weeping, crying, started going out. Cannot stand that presence. People started living according to their spiritual level. Finally, when almost all of them have left, and the author says, I was hanging on. (laughs) He says, tears were flowing out of my eyes like water, he says. 
and I was holding on. And as he was praying, the presence got thicker and thicker. And he says, he, he was almost choked by that presence. And in the end, when he, he, he could stand it no longer, he quickly ran out. He felt that if he didn't run out, he would die in God's presence. And he ran out and uh, almost all broken down. And he says, the man of God was left alone with God. He lived in a presence which nobody else could live. Wow. I like to be like that. Those are samples. You see, one wiggle's work can stir so many ministers. And we realize that there are others like Sadhu Sunna Singh in Asia too. And uh, they, they could stir us. Those are the ducks that fly very fast. That stir us and the whole church begins to be stirred to prepare towards the thing. God is not just going to perfect the church just like that. He's going to call men and women, anoint them to stir the church. And they're going to be the front runners to stir up the church of God. And uh, <clears throat> so behind this first uh, part of Jude are some of those promises that we see here. <clears throat> And uh, we see in uh, verse 9 that we all will be like, in a sense, Moses. Remember Moses, he tasted the presence of God. He entered a certain realm with God. He walked with God. He contacted God. And the Bible says that for Moses, although he was Old Testament, he contacted God and when he saw... You see, there's something about God's presence that when you reach a certain level, it began to affect your physical body. For our physical body is subject to the spiritual world. He was... There are degrees of God's glory and he was with God for so long and one day he says, God, I want to see your glory. And God said, you cannot. No man can see my glory and live. And he says, instead I will show you the back parts of my glory. And when Moses saw the back parts of his glory, take note from a scientific point of view the transformation on his physical body. In the book of Exodus chapter 33. Let's look at Exodus chapter 33. Verse 18. Moses says, please show me your glory. And so God showed him his glory in uh, chapter 34. In uh, verse 5, 6 and 7. And when God showed His glory and Moses came down, in verse 29, Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of testimony were in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that, and look at which part of his face, the skin of his face shone. We are not talking just about his spirit and his soul. His physical Skin cells became phosphorescent. There was light coming out from it. Something happened to the atoms and the molecules that made up his skin cells. Some sort of energy had gone into it. And we see a type of the church in Moses. Where, we be, where, where the glory of God will be seen on His people. That's the prophecy in Isaiah that we saw the last week. And people will see the glory of God on you. I believe that there will be something taking place. Because the rapture is a physical rapture, not a spiritual one. Our bodies will be physically raptured, not just our spirit and soul. 
So something will start taking place by the power of the Spirit in the church. We see in Jude, the positive parts of those things that will take place. And uh, the interesting thing in verse 9 is that Satan is there to oppose. Just as Satan opposed the resurrection of Moses, the church will see things like the glory of God upon them, and uh, then when it comes close to the rapture, Satan himself will try to oppose. There will be satanic opposition. Now you, we understand why Satan comes against the church and why he's trying to pull the church into sin. And he's trying to pull men of God into sin. And uh, a lot of men of God have fallen. It's because he wants to prevent the church from being perfect. He's throwing mud at the church. And God wants to perfect the church. And uh, Moses is an example of that. In time. But there are three things that we need to be aware of in verse 11. Jude summarizes that all these people that were led astray had three basic problems. He says that in verse 11. Uh, verse 11. Number one, the way of Cain. Number two, the error of Balaam. Number three, the rebellion of Korah. The way of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah. If we look at the three examples given to us, Cain, the way of Cain speaks about a totally wrong start. He did the whole thing wrong. While Abel offered the first links of his flock, Cain offered from the cursed ground without blood. And we see in, a, in Cain that there was a, a wrong approach, a wrong method altogether. It is almost like uh, David trying to put the ark on a cart. It's just wrong from the beginning. And God doesn't sanction that. The error of Balaam speaks about people who are sidetracked. So, the way of Cain speaks of people who don't know how to study it correctly. The error of Balaam speaks about those who are sidetracked. They, they may be in God to a certain extent, but they sidetrack like Balaam into something else. And Balaam, if we look at the Old Testament scripture in the book of Numbers, he was greedy for money. And because of money and the things of this world, he sidetracked. He went, he turned aside. He had no staying power. Korah was a different case altogether. Korah went beyond what God tell him to do. So in, uh, in Cain, we see the sin of omission. Not doing what God wants to, to do. God wants blood. He needs a, a blood covenant to approach Him. So His approach is wrong. In, in Balaam, we see Him going off track, diverting, and uh, turning to the left or to the right instead of going straight. In Korah, He's doing fine. But he wants to enter things that God never said to go in. He go beyond the point that God wants to. And we notice three key principles in these three people. Let's just cross reference in the book of Genesis. In the last days, we've got to study these three and understand that these will be the three warning areas. In chapter 4, there are many principles within each one, but we point to the key. Verse 2, Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground. Verse 3, and in the process of time, uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, 
But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. The Lord said, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Verse 7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, the Lord is still saying, telling Cain, Cain, you can change and I will accept you. But Cain just refuses to change. Notice three things. Number one, Abel brought the first links, Cain just brought the offering. He should have brought the first fruits. See, the word first links in the Hebrew means the best of your flock. When Cain brought an offering from his harvest, you know the part of the harvest got once? The first fruits. Not the same like the other side on sheep. The first fruits. So it showed, number one, that he didn't really put God first. God was not number one. God was somewhere else down the line. Two, three, four, five, somewhere. He didn't worship God as number one. God was part of his life, but not the main part. And that's where many Christians are going to fall in the last day. We reach a point where if God is not number one, you will fall to temptation. Secondly, there was an absence of blood. Do not forget that the ground is cursed. God said it in Genesis 3. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Of course, in a sense, you can say everything was cursed because the cattle eat the ground, everything. But there was a difference. Abel had shed blood. So, too, is a necessity of blood. And blood shedding speaks about a covenant relationship with God. That's important. People of God, we need a covenant relationship with God. Does God have a covenant with you? Through Jesus Christ He has. Does God have a personal covenant with you? And have you got a covenant with God? Make a covenant with God. Number three. God asked Cain, where is your brother? In verse 9. Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Number three. Cain denied the fact that he was responsible for his brother. The question, am I my brother's keeper, is you are your brother's keeper. So in a sense, the third point in the way of Cain is Cain did not realize that his brother's death was his death. His brother's downfall was his downfall. He was definitely a selfish person. He said, why should I care about him? So there was no body consciousness. There's no caring one for another. That's the way of Cain. A pastor in the church can ask about another church. Am I my brother's keeper? What happened to that church is no concern of mine. Wait a minute, that's the way of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? I know some pastors take that attitude. But that's not right. Which is why I always say to a lot of pastors who I met, say, no matter what your situation is, what your denomination is, if you're in the ministry, you're down and out, and you need a place, come over. We'll try to encourage you. Because we are our brother's keeper, our sister's keeper, whatever. We are responsible to the whole body of Christ. We cannot isolate ourselves. And that has to change. That's the way of Cain. But we see the emphasis, blood. Let's look at the arrow of Balaam in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 22. (coughs) 
Notice the difference between the perfect will and the permissive will. Okay, now God speaks to Balaam his perfect will. And uh, in verse 12, Numbers chapter 22, verse 12, when the people came, the Balak came to ba- send people to Balaam to curse the Israelites, God said his perfect will to Balaam in verse 12. God said, you shall not go with them. And that is his perfect will. Now look, here is his permissive will because Balaam was persistent in going. And uh, <clears throat> in verse 34-35, Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have seen, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. But he had already gone all the way, almost there. In verse 35, the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the man, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. That is permissive will. You compare the two verses, one said don't go, the other says go. Because God never wanted him to go. But if he, he persisted in going, there was a permissible will. First mistake of Balaam. He didn't differentiate between the perfect will and the permissive will. can be dangerous. There are some things that are God's will that are perfect. There are some things that are permitted by God. Every church and every minister needs to differentiate between God's perfect will and God's permissible, permissive will. Because under permissive will, there is still some blessing. First mistake of Balaam. He didn't differentiate between the perfect will and the permissive will. can be dangerous. There are some things that are God's will that are perfect. There are some things that are permitted by God. Every church and every minister needs to differentiate between God's perfect will and God's permissible, permissive will. Because under permissive will, there is still some blessing there, but that's not the kind of blessing God wants you to enter. Secondly, we see in um, verse um, 14, And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balak, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balak sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they, more powerful people. People of influence, fame, and rich and powerful. And in verse 16, they came to Balaam. And do you know that was how Balaam got persuaded? Because he bowed down to riches and honor for men. So that's the second area, the watchword, so that we are not like Balaam, is to check ourselves, are you influenced just because of reputation or because of the written word? Because in the last days, it can be reputable men. And that is why I always tell Christians, we don't follow a man of God only because he's famous either. We follow and check out what is said by the written word. So that if a man of God who is famous says the baptism in the spirit is not necessary with tongues, and we say, yeah, yeah, that's the way to follow, because he's famous. But if you check the word, you know that there's strong evidence that tongues is for all. We are going to lose out. We are people who bow down to honor for men rather than following the word. And we will, a church will never be perfected. So we have to honor the word of God above all else. Thirdly, in Balaam's life, chapter 23, Verse 1, Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And he did everything. 
And uh, in verse 4 and 5, the Lord, verse 5, put a word in Balaam's mouth. And three times that occurred. And in the end, Balaam received nothing from Bala because God would still use him. And that's the, the third and the strangest thing. That even though God was still using Balaam, one of the most beautiful prophecies came from his mouth about Israel. But do you notice what he did? He taught Bala how to deceive and make the Israelites fall. It was Balaam who did it. Bala wouldn't, wouldn't know how to do it. And that's the third problem with Balaam. He wanted the money so much that he would compromise his principles. Where principles are compromised. Well, let's run on to Korah. He is in the book of Numbers, chapter 16. Verse 9. Moses said to Korah, Is it a small thing to you that God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you next to himself to do the work of the tabernacle? Now Korah was among the Levites of the tribe of Kohath. And the, there are three different tribes of Levites. And each one of them got different responsibilities. To the Kohathites were given the best job. They were to carry and help carry the ark and the t- all the table of showbread. The, the internal instruments. And Korah was one of the leaders there. Number one, if you don't want to be a Korah, number one, do not despise the small, small things that God asks us to do. The small little things that God asks us to do. Do not despise the small little commands that God gives us to do. We have to obey. I know a lot of men of God who have grown so big that they will not obey God to do small things. And I think they may get out of God's will. Because I know God enough. He will let you do big things. He will also tell you to do small things. And we need to obey God. Because the obeying the Lord became only obeying for big things. They forget about the smaller thing. And I believe in obeying God in the small things as well. Not just in the big things. Secondly, verse 10. And that He has brought you Near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you, and are you seeking the priesthood also? Number two, he sought for somebody else's office, which he himself did not have. And he didn't seek it the right way. He claimed it by himself. So it was Korah, uh, who wanted, he didn't, instead of going on his knees and t- asking it from God, he tried to usurp it. Verse 11. Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? See, they wanted Aaron's job. So they wanted to usurp the offices of, that God has drawn a line and established. And they got into trouble. The third, third thing is in verse 11, they knew, or Korah knew, how to gather a group around his own goals. Not the Lord's goals. He knew how to influence people and he knew how to achieve his own ends because he was also a leader. That's very dangerous. Because God can show up on the scene, which He did in Korah's case. Recently, I'm sure you hear about the Kansas City prophets. Actually, they are a move from God. Whatever things you think they're extreme, they are a move from God. In that same city, 
is another minister who went against that church. That minister never lasted. And you know what he did? He wrote books against them. Did everything he can against them. And today that minister is no more around. He just resigned and has left. I'm talking about incident in the United States. The whole city, those are the two biggest churches, the whole city was divided because that man was against the prophetic move. Now I know in every move they're extreme, but it doesn't mean I'm going to go against any move of God. Why should I write books against people? Why not write books to teach people? And listen carefully, because I know what the Lord's going to do. They are Many men who do write books against other people and they snub some of those, those Pentecostal leaders of God. Watch. God may not deal with them immediately, but you watch over several years. Because that's how the mercy of God is long. Over several years. And you watch what happens. Watch over a period of five years to ten years. And see whether God protects His work or not. I guarantee you He wills. But the work of Korah is this. That man has stumbled many others. Books like The Seduction of Christianity has caused more Christians to lose their faith than have helped more Christians. These books should never be written. Because the purpose of this book is to go against somebody. And trying to use Shibboleth, you know, the Shibboleth, Shibboleth. By naming people Gnosticism and this and that and branding them, we want to identify them and then put them as a bullseye to shoot our arrows. That's not God's method for correcting errors. And that is a Korah symptom. Now, if we study very carefully in the book of Jude, these are the three big warnings on those areas. And in those three big, big warnings, in Cain, remember the blood. Don't run away from the blood. The blood is where the grace is. And in Balaam, remember the word. Don't run from the word. Stay true to the word, come what may. Whether you are, uh, uh, you are alone or in a majority, stay true to the word, the perfect word and will of God. In number three, remember the key, the spirit, the anointing of God. When I see an anointing flowing and a man winning souls and etc., why should I go against a man if he has a few things that are not perfect? Amen? There's no purpose. I mean, there are some people who wrote books against Sho Yong Gi, but that man has won more souls than those authors. Why should we be calling Cho Yong Gi a car? He's not. He's a born again Christian. We're a good church. Or some others. Remember, the Spirit, those people are winning souls through their anointing. And uh, let's, let's just stay clear of some areas. Now, I may not agree with everything, but I would say that's a man of God still. See, I'm not advocating the other extreme either of total submission without questioning. That is also wrong. I'm not saying that we don't think through some of those things. Like for example, Chu Yungi has a book on the fourth dimension. And on, in that book, he talks about Rema and Logos. And he compared Rema and Logos to people walking on water. And he says that, uh, and then he turns it to healing. But I analyze it from the word and it's not really that. Because walking, in, walking on water is not a promise. Healing is a promise. Can you see my analysis? Now, I still respect that man. But it doesn't mean that I swallow everything. I still compare it to the Word of God. In no way can you compare walking on water with healing. God did not say, in my name they shall walk on water. But He did say, in my name they shall lay hands on the sea and they shall be healed. And there are countless other scriptures that promise healing. 
So you see, my analysis is based purely on the word. But I still respect that man. Still love that man. My analysis of Rema and Logos, and I teach on what Rema is, what Logos is, and explain it differently, but we still got lots to learn from that man. Rather than join the other camp that start running against these people. Because that is the Korah spirit. It's important for us to take note. These are the things. And as we see this thing coming in the last days in the church, we need to stay true to the things of God and stand forth in them. Well, let's go to the rest of the scriptures to close. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, Lord. And uh, in verse 14, there's Enoch the seven from Adam prophesied about this man also saying, Behold, the Lord came, comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. And uh, the other man to watch in the last days is Enoch. All those things that are relevant for the church to understand about the rapture are found in the life of Enoch. You could analyze his life from the time he walked with God after the birth of his child. And if you take that to be an allegory, the birth of his child is a symbol of an, an, a completion of something and moving on into the things of God. And uh, you tie it to scriptures like Isaiah about the woman laboring in birth. And uh, all those things, you'll find a type of the rapture church in Enoch. Okay, that's a key for you to dig deeper into God's Word. And he concludes from verse uh, 20 onwards with the same H.O. exhortation that we cannot run away. Number one, build on our faith. Number two, praying in the Holy Spirit. Number three, verse 22, Keep in the love of God. And those things we cannot let go. Faith, praying in the Spirit, and love are three important areas that we need to continue deeply in God. So that we, we could move and prepare for the last days. I could, could see that in the last days, it's not just a revival of power, it's a revival of love. Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we ask that you would cause each one of us to understand your word, establish us, so that we know, O oh God, how to analyze your word, how to put your word first in our lives, and yet have a reverence and a respect for all those generations that have gone before us. Men of God, Lord, who have lived in our lifetime and who are leaders in our lifetime, that we will learn all we can from them, O oh God. And yet we will press on further, Lord, and build upon this good foundation that has been given to us, Lord, and press on deeper into the things of God that you show each one of us. We ask, O oh God, that you would establish each one of us in your word, and Father, we pray even right now, tonight, that whatever your Spirit speaks into our hearts for us to give up of the small things in life, O oh God, things that would show how much we really love you, small areas, small little sacrifices that will go a long way towards a big sacrifice. We ask, O oh God, that you teach us, Lord, your ways and establish us in your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a clap offering. God bless you.